Hello again to whoever decides to uh, listen slash watch this thing, uh, which is the latest in a new little series that I, for some reason, decided to call Toki Time. So uh, this is pretty much another video in the uh, longer running uh, little series that I'm doing here about ecofeminism and various ecofeminist uh, philosophers, this time focusing on the work of Laurie Gruen. Now, Laurie Gruen, uh, much of the time, her work is uh, somewhat as a facilitator. She has probably one, at present, one major work, which we will be looking at, but she often facilitates um, discussions more so. So two of the texts we'll be looking at are actually essay collections, of which she contributed one to two essays, essentially, and the rest was more so her editing and um, preparing the entire text in general. So uh, for Laurie Gruen, we will be looking at four of her texts. So we're looking at uh, the first one, which is Ethics and Animals, an introduction. So that's kind of an introductory text to animal, um, sort of eco-feminist animal sort of stuff in general. Um, then we will be looking at the two um, essay collections. So the one is Eco-Feminism, uh, eco Feminist Interactions with Other Animals and the Earth, which she uh, co-edited with uh, Carol J. Adams, who's also another uh, very prominent um eco-feminist writer, and then we'll be looking at Animalities, which is uh, by co-edited with uh, Laurie Gruen and uh, Fiona proben Rapsi. I don't know her work as well, but yes, she contributed a few things here, and then uh, her probably her major work, uh, which we'll be do, doing last, which is actually, in terms of uh, chronology of publishing, is actually the third one here, but we're going to do it last because it's sort of the most in-depth um, personal uh, writings, and that is Entangled Empathy, an Alternative Ethic for Our Relationship with Animals. So those are the four texts that we are going to look at. Um, so that should be very fun. Uh, now the first one is actually more so of an overview of um, animals and ethics. So it's more so animal studies than than specifically ecofeminism, but there is definitely sort of a an ecofeminist bend to uh, her work in general. So essentially, this book starts with a very, very simple chapter title, and it is Why Animals Matter. Not saying, do animals matter, but specifically, why they matter. Like, I will now explain why they matter, okay? So, a lot of the stuff, uh, some of us, hopefully, do already agree that animals have intrinsic worth. Like, they, they do not have worth because they can help us, but more so because they exist, they are alive, um, and they are capable of experiencing uh, various sensory experiences just like us, and so they should be treated with some level of respect. Um, so, funsies. But of course, that isn't the way it is. As she says on page two, they have been the source of entertainment, inspiration, loyalty, and devotion. Non-human animals also serve a conceptual role in helping us define ourselves as human. We are not them. It is against the animal that we define humanity. Their differences from us highlight our similarity to other animals. See, animals have been used as yeah, entertainment. We, we, you know, they, they keep us entertained. Uh, they inspire us. Uh, they have loyalty and um, devotion to them or their devotion towards us. So these are things we usually think of them, but animals are also specifically, or non-human animals as a term you should preferably use, we define ourselves in relation to the animal, essentially as a binary. So we are human, they are animal. Not A lot of people don't like, um, especially people of a more religious persuasion, do not like being told that uh, humans are a type of animal, which um, <laughs> we are. So <laughs> <sighs> that's a very fun thing about some people. They don't like this idea that, that humans are just another form of animal, and that's actually why we like to use the term human animal. So she talks about human exceptionalism. This is the idea that we are above um, humans. We are the exception. Okay, we are above them. We are different to them, etc., etc., etc. Very, very fun. Um, but of course, the thing about this human exceptionalism thing is that we stick to human exceptionalism to such a degree that it doesn't actually make sense. 
So as she says on page four, philosophers, generally known for their consistent reasoning, have not been completely consistent in their attitudes about ethics and animals. This is probably due, at least in part, to an untenable commitment to human exceptionalism. We stick to this idea of like humans being better and superior to everything else because that's what we believe. We are humans, so we do have an inherent bias towards ourselves. That is to be understood. That's understandable. Uh, but the idea is that we are unique and that we have something uh, or we do something that makes us superior. So we are special. We are different and better to them, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but, well, animals do have many of the same things that, that we do. And there's this idea that there are certain things which they they deserve to have, right? Um, for instance, like life and bodily health and bodily integrity and having um, senses and having emotions and etc. So basically, these are capabilities that, that we sort of think humans have, but actually animals also have them. Uh, now, you can get into all sorts of specifics about where uh, animal ends and where something else begins. There are arguments to be had about all sorts of things. For instance, a lot of um, people who believe in strong animal rights do not have the same attitudes towards insects uh, or fish because we, we believe that they are different. But But as she does point out in chapter two, she says, OK, listen, we have always... A lot of the time in in um, ethics, we've believed that this idea of uh, somebody having agency, right? A human being has agency. They are able to choose to do things. That they can do what they want to do, which is why humans are considered to be moral agents. They are capable of making moral decisions, right? Now, we say animals are not capable of making moral decisions. And so some philosophers have said that means we can do what we want to them. Uh, if you look at a whole bunch of philosophers, uh, people like um, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, he said that we shouldn't hurt animals, but not because uh, it's bad for the animal, like animal doesn't matter. It matters because if you hurt animals, you might be, um, you know, you might be more likely to then hurt people. So it's not actually about the animal, it's about your character as a human. So that becomes like a whole thing there. And then you get to someone like Descartes, who didn't give like a damn about animals and he was all for vivisection uh if you don't know what vivisection is you can look it up because i think some people might be upset by the idea um if you don't want to know about animal abuse things do not look up what vivisection is but if you do not know what it is and you're curious about what it is you can just google it it isn't nice uh but he was more than happy to say yes we should do vivisection on animals it's all cool it's all fun uh and lots of philosophers have sort of not cared. Uh, Kant, who is like the, the sort of most, one of the most sort of famous ones, uh, philosophers in terms of, of ethics, ultimately believe that animals don't really matter. They, they, they are not capable of being what he called ends in themselves. They were not capable of actually having their own um, cares. They were simply what would be called mere means. We can use an animal like we can use a toaster. It's just a thing. It's an object. However, she draws a distinction here between moral agents, so people who are, or creatures that are capable of having moral decisions, and moral patients, those who are able to receive moral decisions. And animals are able to receive moral decisions. All right? So that's quite, you know, <laughs> obvious. Uh, a dog might not be able to choose to be cruel to a person. However, uh, a dog can be kicked by someone. So they are able to receive moral actions, but they are not able to necessarily uh, have moral actions. They cannot do something moral or immoral because they do not have that sense. So, fun. Now, much of this book is actually just an overview of the things we do to animals. And I will actually do a video that goes in-depth into that at some point. It will be a very, very depressing, very, very horrible video. Um, but I will go into that. So here, essentially, just to say, she brings up the problem with, obviously, eating animals and the problems of things like factory farms, uh, experimenting with animals for various reasons, um, keeping animals captive, which you could also uh, apply to so-called companion animals, which would be, you know, 
pets. Um, they are also kept in that sense. They are not actually free. Uh, and then how we treat animals in the wild and also how we go about doing uh, supposed animal protection, how we actually protect them or also the way we think about protection of animals. So those are uh, overviews that I will probably go into in depth at some point, but um, not right now because I would want that to be its own video. Uh, also because that goes into a lot of really depressing things. <sighs> so, on to the next book, which is Ecofeminism, Feminist Interactions with Other Animals and the Earth. This is the one that she co-edited with uh, Carol J. Adams. Now, she... I'm not going to go into the, the book itself because obviously these are written by other people, which means they are not necessarily her work, so she facilitated. However, here she essentially starts off, because this is about ecofeminism specifically, she does essentially start off uh, in the introduction, which is co-written by Carol J. Adams and Laurie Gruen, and has quite a great quote about essentially what ecofeminism is. She says, ecofeminism is on uh, page 60. Ecofeminism addresses the various ways that sexism, heteronormativity, racism, colonialism, and ableism are informed by and support speciesism and how analyzing the way these forces intersect and produce less violent, more just practices. So essentially, she is saying ecofeminism is about looking at how all these things intersect with each other and how then, if we can understand this intersection, we can move towards something that is, you know, better. Um, and now she also, in this particular text, talks about how dualistic thinking so that's that idea uh, of you know one two it's like a binary right humans animals that they are distinct entities from each other um she talks about how that is actually a bad thing it's not a good thing um and that is something that uh, a lot of academia is sort of framed that way a lot of academia operates in that particular sense so that is something that we should move away from this kind of binary thinking, this idea that there is a, you know, a, a one to two relation between things, you know, uh, humans and nature, uh, civilization and nature, uh, logic and emotions, like these are not actually these kind of binaries that we a lot of the times believe in are not really true. Uh, and there's something that should be uh, countered and discussed rather than just believed because that's what we do we tend to just believe things it's also binary thinking is also just a thing that human beings often do right we we like to think of things in terms of black and white we go okay uh, and by black and whites i don't mean uh, races although races as well because we tend to have this um oppositional nature in which we see black people versus white people but obviously there's a lot more than just black people and white people but we have this idea of this specific distinction between the two of uh, civilization versus nature when actually nature exists all around us and civilization is trying to create some sense of order out of nature but it's still there. Like everything is actually built out of natural things. There's no such thing as something that's like truly artificial because everything had to be made from nature. Nature is everywhere. We have just morphed it into a, a shape that uh, appeases us. You know, um, once upon a time we lived in caves. We still live in caves, but now we call them houses. Uh, we can build our caves wherever we want. But effectively, when you look at it, it's it's a thing with a ceiling and like an entrance and it keeps you warm. It's a cave. Um, but we have this idea that we're so special and different and unique and that, you know, there's good and there's bad and there's there's humans and there's animals and there's there's uh, men and there's women. Uh, not understanding that there is, you know, things that exist between this, that it's not so much a binary and more so a spectrum of, of things. So that is a, a fundamental thing in a lot of... Um, ecofeminism, that binary thinking is something that we need to move away from. We need to try to embrace the idea of plurality, the idea that there is uh, lots of different voices and that it isn't, it isn't just this binary thinking. But anyway, anyway, she did write basically one um, essay itself in this, in this particular text, um, which is titled, it's the seventh essay and it's titled Facing Death and Practicing Grief. So, this one is essentially talking about um, this idea of uh, extinctionism in some senses. So the idea that we should allow 
uh, domesticated animals to die out so that um, so that like that suffering doesn't exist anymore, right? Because at the moment, this is the thing about domestic animals, is that domestic animals live an existence of pure domination under humans. Humans control everything about their lives, domestic animals. Uh, that includes pets, right? Uh, unless a pet runs away, the, a pet is always under your complete control. Even if, say, you know, uh, they're not house trained, so they keep peeing in the house, they are still under your complete control because you can broadly get away with doing anything to an animal. Um, sometimes people might get, you know, um, punished in some sense for animal abuse, but a lot of the time you could just get away with it because if a, if you were to kill a dog, there isn't really like a cop that comes around because the dog hasn't been seen around. Like, like you could just get away with it. There's no like death certificates or anything. Um, a lot of these things can just be can just disappear and nobody knows about them. Uh, it's harder to do that with, you know, humans. But animals are under our complete domination. We can do whatever we want to them. And, of course, we do also raise certain animals specifically to kill them, uh, which will be, you know, agricultural animals, uh, livestock, cows, pigs, chickens, etc. We raise them to kill them or we raise them to exploit them, such as milk production, so we can later kill them. So... There is this idea that eco-feminists are basically accused of being extinctionists, that they want to essentially let them all die. So say, for instance, you would do something like um, uh, sterilize all the animals and then it, it will, they'll be dead in a generation. But this is generally not the idea. It's actually uh, this more entangled empathetic response. Now, this is a, a concept that we'll, we'll go into more in depth when we actually do the last text, which is Entangled Empathy, um, which has this, this concept of entangled empathy, which is um, a, a big thing. So, yeah, um, the idea, though, is that more so we need to try to actually help these animals, not kill them off, but more so liberate them, right? Um, save them from the existence that they currently have, not not extinctionists, not kill them all, uh, although that is, of course, a, a thing worth probably discussing because there are so many uh, domestic animals that will die, no matter what, uh, and they'll die and they'll have horrible existences. But if we were to stop the meat industry properly, what you would probably want to do is stop all of these animals from existing ultimately um, because there isn't really place for them anymore. You, you can't really put cows out into the wild in general, at least I don't think so. So it becomes difficult because we want to believe, right, that um, that we can sort of protect everything and that everything will be great if we, if we just work on it and try and help. Like, we don't want to have extinctionism. We want to be able to save all those animals, but that's actually really difficult. And... What's also horrible is that even, so as she points out, even vegans, right, who, um, the whole idea is that, like, veganism, un unless it's, I don't know, medical, it's generally ethical. It's for an ethical reason. You don't want to be complicit in the murder of animals. That, understandable. However, you are still complicit in the murder of animals and the destruction of natural habitat with just land, the land necessary to grow uh, food for vegans to eat, it still relies on destruction, which is something that vegans tend to ignore because there isn't really an alternative. However, they do still kill less than meat eaters. So even when meat eaters try to use this argument, it's still a nonsense argument because, yeah, uh, and basically living requires dying, which is wonderful uh, but we need to sort of come to terms with this this is why it's called facing death and practicing grief we need to come to terms with the idea that that these creatures or well, all creatures die um eventually and there will always be death it will always sort of be around uh for instance there is this idea now this isn't her idea don't worry this is just a an idea that is floated by you get some uh, i think it's more sort of like a deep ecological um argument which is nonsense. Uh, it, there isn't. It isn't very often that it's it's um, 
beneficial or uh, productive to say that something that's academic is is nonsense or stupid. Like usually, it's, it's you want to discuss it. But there is this idea in some people that, which is nonsense. It is the idea of the elimination of predation. That's the idea of eliminating predators, so as to eliminate the um, the problems of you know predation. So predators getting rid of carnivores. Um, so if you were to kill off all the carnivores, there might not be any more death, but they still will be actually because everything does die. Um, but that idea is so sort of fundamentally misunderstanding of uh, ecology that if you were to kill all the carnivores, the entire environment would just collapse because it's built on a coexistence between the two. So it's a, you know, <sighs> fun little thing. But anyway, let's move on to the sort of the next text. So that one was, you know, that last one was more about how we need to learn to accept grief and to process it properly. Now, this one is from her, her uh, next book, which is actually the fourth book, but we're looking at a third because of, yeah, anyway, uh, Animalities, which is actually a fantastic book in general. Um, some fantastic essays in here that I would recommend people read, um, but also a lot of really depressing stuff. If you're going to read anything eco-feminist, you're going to read a lot of depressing things about the things we do to animals. So if you can't handle that kind of stuff, don't read anything eco-feminist, like at all. It's pretty much misery through and through. So, <sighs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, this one, uh, Animalities, uh, which is uh, Laurie Gruen and Proben Rapsi. I don't really know how to pronounce her name. Anyway, uh, the first sort of text in this is called Distillations. It's like an introduction. And it's talking about this concept of animalities, which is like a, the idea that there's this disease of, of how we uh, see current human um, animal relations. Um, they describe it as like this idea of, um, you know, the way we see animals is wrong, fundamentally wrong. It's a disease. We need to fix it. Um, now, this goes into a bit more in depth in terms of um, animal studies stuff in general, because they discuss um, Peter Singer and Tom Regan. Now, for a very, very quick, brief understanding of Peter Singer and Tom Regan. Okay, Peter Singer is a utilitarian, and he believed that we need to reduce the amount of suffering of animals, right? So it's essentially a greater good thing, or, you know the lesser evil in this particular sense. We need to reduce the amount of suffering, but that some animals are not capable of suffering, like insects. Um, so it becomes, you know, like that. Then Regan, however, uh, his approach was more what's called deontological, which is uh, a Kantian approach. And that is more about the idea of natural rights, that um, creatures should have a natural right. So as I said before, earlier in this uh, video slash audio, depends on how you consume it, um, that Kant had this idea of um, things being means in them, uh, uh, ends in themselves and means to an end. Now, to Kant, animals are means to an end. We can use them for our own ends. They don't actually matter. Regan basically said, no, 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 no. Animals are also ends in themselves. So it was sort of this idea of using the same kind of ideas of um, of rationality, Right. Singer, utilitarian. Regan, deontological. Both of them work specifically in rationality and reason. They ignore emotionality. That's like the whole thing, which is something that eco-feminists often criticize. So, as it says on page 19, to separate emotion from reason once and for all is, from a feminist ethics of care perspective, akin to reinstating a mind-body dualism. A false dichotomy that underscores not only the masculine-feminine binary, but also the human-animal one. So, we have this idea, right, in certain philosophical circles that you should not uh, have any emotionality in your work. Like, no, 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 no emotions, no emotions, emotions, are um, we should not have emotions. No, we have to be very, very logical about all of this. Uh, very, very logical. Uh, reason, we must have reason. Uh, we are we are philosophers, after all. That's sort of the, the general um, belief a lot of the time in philosophy. Uh, Ecofeminism says, no, no, no. You should not try to separate emotion from reason. You should not say that, oh, no, rationality and emotion are completely separate from each other. They're not. They are 
inherently connected to each other. And to try to create that binary is just reinforcing the mind-body dualism, which also, like the same thing with masculine and feminine, so men, woman, and also human animal. So by saying, oh no, emotionality and rationality must be separate, you are simply reinforcing a dualism that should not exist. Um, these kind of binary you know, thoughts shouldn't exist. Now also, of course, they, they ended off with a little thing here, which is so true. Um, a lot of left-wing groups who will be fighting for various, you know, um, human rights in general, right, uh, and helping human beings, a lot of them have been somewhat hostile towards animal rights groups because they think that that trivializes human issues, which is wrong. Uh, animal rights groups, is, well, okay, I'm sure there are some who would not agree, but generally in, from an eco-feminist perspective, animal rights and human rights are fundamentally connected to each other. Because what are humans? They are animals. Uh, they are connected to each other. There is not actually a distinction between human and animal in that a strong sense. Uh, you'll pretty much see that all eco-feminists are pretty much also all those other things. They'll be anti-racism. They'll be anti-sexism. They'll be uh, anti-transphobia, etc., etc. Because you cannot be uh, on the side of believing that humans and animals are the same uh, in terms of you know, uh, morality. You can't believe that while also being like, oh, yes, yes, we, we believe that, but you know, uh, gay people are less. That's, that doesn't work. They, they do not work together. Um, so pretty much an eco-feminist animal rights group is a group that will be also for basically all the same things as left-wing groups. They won't be um, anti-human. They'll just be pro-animal. One does not negate the other, which is something that some groups don't seem to really understand. So... That's fun. Now, there's only really one little, uh, one other little sort of essay in here that was actually written by uh, Gruen, and that is the very first one, which is called Just Say No to Lobotomy. Now, this is talking about the inherent connection between lobotomies, right? Lobotomies are connected to um, the suppression and repression of women and animals. Okay, lobotomies were pretty much created as a way of suppressing woman emotions. Uh, they were used as a way of like, you know, a woman would have hysteria. She would have emotions like some disgusting animal. Um, and so you needed to lobotomize her to fix her, to make her stop feeling that way because it's not very helpful. Now, is it? Now, that was the, the belief, right? The botomies now we know are like extremely cruel and awful and they don't work either. So it's sort of like, just by saying it's cruel, it's unethical, should be enough to disqualify it, but it also doesn't work. So it's, it shouldn't exist at all. Now it doesn't anymore, so that's cool, cool. However, when they were testing lobotomies, creating it, developing it, it was done on chimpanzees. The things that we do to animals are things that we then want to do on humans, but we're testing it out on animals. Right? This is with like all sorts of things. We want to do something. Okay, lobotomy is in the sense we're a bad thing, but let's say medicine. You want to do medicine and make good medicine for humans. What do we do to to do that? Simple. We torture animals to see how much of that pill they can take. We okay, I, I said I don't want to get into like the heavy stuff we do to animals because that will be its own video at some point, um, because it should be. But we all know. Right, the things that people do to animals um, in the name of experimentation, in the name of, of um, helping humans. Um, like you will get a lot of people who will say, no, I'm, I'm fine with, with, with like medical ones. Like I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I don't agree with like the, the cosmetic ones, right? Like I'm fine with them testing chemo on a chimp, but not mascara. Um, that's how humans, some humans tend to think, you know, we're fine. It, it, Basically, it's a utilitarian approach. The greater good. Yes, we have to kill a few puppies, but we'll get better diabetes medication out of it. So you have this internal calculation in your head going, okay, are a couple of puppies worth diabetes patients? Yes, cool. But then you would usually go, okay, lipstick doesn't actually matter in the grand scheme. And so um, we shouldn't, do whatever awful things we might do with lipstick on an animal. Uh, we shouldn't do it because it's not worth it. 
But the things that we do to hurt people, we often test on animals first. Humans and animals are connected in that sense. They are both part of this awful system that hurts them both. And that's basically what she looked at. And she also talks about how our empathy becomes entangled, which is where we get to the last thing, which is actually the third, third book. Um, ignore the order. So entangled empathy, an alternative ethic for our relationship with animals. Wonderful. So this is where she introduces this idea of entangled empathy, which is a very interesting idea. So let's first start off. When she is first talking about this, she basically looks at how the different ethical theories kind of failed. We've already sort of spoken about that with um, Peter Singer and Tom Regan, right? Their whole thing was grounded in, in reason and blah, blah, blah. And through reason, you can justify all sorts of things. You know, through a utilitarian approach, you can justify a Holocaust. You can justify all sorts of things. You can justify killing some in the name of a few. The trolley problem, which has been turned into a meme, basically. But everyone knows what the trolley problem is, if you don't know the name. The trolley problem is that idea that there's a trolley, right, driving somewhere. And it's going to run over six people. But you can pull a lever, which will then turn it onto another track, where it will only kill one person. No matter what, you have to kill someone for this to work. Uh, it's a it's a thought experiment. But the idea is that no matter what, you're going to have to kill someone. Because the thing is, if you take the action, you are choosing to kill someone. However, if you do not pull the lever, you are choosing to not do something which kills people. So both action and inaction are both actions, and they are both ethical. You cannot, if you see something happening, you can't look away. You can't turn away and pretend it doesn't exist. That is still an ethical choice. So these ethical theories don't work because ultimately someone has to lose for them to work. Um, now, she wants to look at that and say, listen, this is not actually a good way of looking at ethics, right? We shouldn't have basically calculus to figure out which which person should we save? Should we save this one or this one? Uh, well, the costs in this one is, but the, the benefits in this one is, we shouldn't be doing that. And we also shouldn't be doing it from a deontological perspective. Now, that is the more rights-based perspective because rights also exclude and rights also don't actually help. <laughs> rights will be something that's like, okay, you cannot do this thing. You cannot kill these people. Cool, I won't kill them. Rights do not say that they have the right to be helped. It's just the right that they cannot be hurt. So you're like, oh, okay, so they can just then not get any help. Like, as long as we don't kill that person, we're fine. You know, so long. That, so let's say in uh, countries where uh, we had um, restricted voting, right? So say only white people could vote. Then we said, okay, cool. Black people can vote too. Now you have the right. Everyone can vote. However, there are still factors that mean that disadvantaged people who generally are not white will not then be able to vote. So, yes, I have the right to vote, but I can't take a day off work because they won't let me take a day off work. So if I take a day off work, I'll lose my job. So I can't go vote. Uh, I don't have anyone to look after the kids because I don't have the money to because I can't. I have like a job that doesn't pay very well, but I couldn't even go to like university because I can't afford to go to university. So I'm stuck in a terrible job the whole time. I can't actually vote. I am, yes, legally I can vote, but I can't. I can't go there because... So South Africa, where I'm from, is probably a better example because South Africa, uh, voting it usually takes place over a couple of days and there'll be public holidays. So that works because most people can get off on a public holiday. In places like America, voting day is not a public holiday. It'll be like in the middle of the week. So people who can't just take off work because they feel like voting, they don't get to vote. So yes, yes, black people have the vote. Does that mean that they can actually exercise their right? No, but the ontological perspective doesn't really care about that. So she's saying we need an alternative. That's why literally chapter one is called Seeking an Alternative Ethic. Now, she also talks about how basically this is overall an ethics of care. 
Now, ethics of care is seen as a response to an ethics of justice, which is what we usually think of as ethics, um, which is something like deontological or utilitarian. Now, an ethics of care is more about, as you know, that might make sense, um, caring <laughs> about someone. So this wouldn't say you have the right to do something. This is, I will help you to exercise that right. It's actually trying, <laughs> basically. It's it's a less lazy form of ethics than the others. Um, now, this is how she also defines it, the differences between traditional uh, ethics versus the ethics of care. One of them focuses on abstraction, right? So it's like all this moral universal concepts. The other is on context. So like the one says, everyone can vote. Whereas context, you say, yep, some people can't vote. So we should help those people. So it's focused on context. One of these focuses on individualism. The other focuses on relationality. So individualism is everyone gets a vote, everyone gets a vote right? Everyone as an individual. This is more saying, no, no, we need to look at how people are interconnected with each other. So it's also impartiality versus connection, right? The idea of a lot of like rights is that they're very impartial, they're very, impartial, they're very like non-personal. They don't want to actually be involved, essentially. They're like, no, 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 we don't want to actually be involved in stuff. We just, you know, leave us alone. It's, it's fine. Whereas an ethics of care is more about how it's all connected to each other. And then there's this idea of conflict versus responsiveness. Traditional ones are very conflict-focused, um, Having like those kinds of, um, you know, those those thought experiments, like the trolley experiment. I don't know what 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 will happen if you have to either ch kill six or kill one. What will you do? Um, whereas this doesn't do that. This is more like okay, no, no, no. We need to actually look at how to respond to sort of everyday situations, not this other nonsense. So she knows first off, and she makes it clear that humans. Or anthropocentric. Now, anthropocentric, if you don't know what that means, so anthro means human, centric means centered on, so centered on humans. We are inevitably anthropocentric. You are a human, so therefore you will think about humans first. You think about yourself before you think of others, right? That's inevitable. She even calls it inevitable anthropocentrism. But then you get arrogant anthropocentrism, which is the dominant belief that humans, therefore, because we think of ourselves first, we are also better. We are better than the others. We are dominant. So she wants, obviously, to be like, no, 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 we need to get rid of that nonsense. How do we do that? Empathy. Now, empathy, she basically sees as being um, more important than sympathy. So sympathy is being able to perceive someone else's perspective. I can see it through your eyes. That's sympathy. Empathy is actually feeling for someone, which means it has more grip. It's more emotional, right? So types of empathy, right? You get like personal empathy when you can actually connect with another person, all right? When you can actually have a reflective response to something you see or something like projection, right? Um, where you can't even really tell whether you're feeling bad for them or if you're actually feeling bad for yourself for like you can actually can you actually feel what the other person is experiencing so this is the idea of empathy right we want to try to foster empathy and this is where the idea of entanglement comes in so empathy is that that feeling right being able to actually feel for another person right so now she talks about entanglement of empathy on page 66 she says this is the entanglement of entangled empathy. We are not just in relationship as selves with others, but ourselves are constituted by these relations. So a lot of the idea is that we are all individuals, right? And that have relationship with each other. And she says, no, 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 it's not so much that. It's more so the self is built on the relation to others. Individualism only works when there are lots of people and that they are all basically working together and that we are we define ourselves by other people so we become entangled in each other we we can perceive them for what they are and they can perceive us so we're we're entangled with each other the idea here is that it's a non-hierarchical non-dualistic way of looking at things so non-hierarchical means 
that it doesn't have a hierarchy. So no one's on top. No one's at the bottom. And then non-dualistic, it isn't them and me, it's us. We are together. We are a connection. Um, there is something about this relationship between us that is essentially a two-way street. It isn't just, you know, um, it isn't just us versus you. It's you and I are together. And we're not actually necessarily distinct from one another. All right. So empathy is something we need to work on because it is impossible to avoid anthropocentrism. It's impossible. So we need to try to actually understand, to care about others, to care about them and to essentially see them as more so friends, right? Because it's easy, as she says here in chapter four, which is called improving empathy. It's really, really easy to build empathy for someone who's close to you. That's easy. But having empathy for others can be really, really hard for people we don't know or for animals. Animals can't speak our language. It's difficult to understand them. It's technically impossible to actually truly understand a non-human animal. But we need to try to basically understand them as much as we can. Okay, we need to actually try we need to work on seeing through the eyes of another. Now, that's sympathy, technically, being able to check from their perspective. But how would they feel? How would I feel if I were in their shoes? How would they feel if they were in my shoes? We need to have this essentially reciprocal relationship with each other. We need to work together to understand each other. Now, an animal, non-human animal, is not actually looking to understand you. They, they don't they don't know you. Why, why would they know you? Why would they care? Right? So, that is what we need to then be. We need to be the side that does. Because the thing is, animals can't actually really do anything to us. They can't really hurt us. Uh, they could on a personal level. But, you know, a, an animal isn't going to run for president and win. So, it's up to us, in a sense, to increase our empathy and to try to understand them and to try to, in a sense have a reciprocal relationship. Try to communicate with them as far as we can and to have empathy for them. And uh, I think that's pretty much it for now. <sighs> yeah. So that was Laurie Gruen's work. I hope that you liked it. Uh, I hope I did it some level of justice. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty much that. Uh, if you want to find any of the other things I do, you can look in the description. Um, all the things are there, the, the Twitter and the other places. Uh, yeah. I'm probably going to leave now. I hope that everybody has an absolutely fantastic day, week, and month ahead. I hope. Um, try to be more empathetic. Not and Here's the thing, not just towards non-human animals. You need to try to have empathy for other human beings as well. Which I know is hard. People can be uh, terrible. People can be very terrible. And we don't necessarily want to associate ourselves with those kinds of people. But if you can learn to have empathy for even those you do not actually like. Understand why they think the things they do. You might just find it a bit easier overall in life. So that's it. Goodbye.